him to engrossing death. Here's to my love. Poison! I'll kiss thy lips. Aptly some poison doth yet hang on him. Bang! Welcome to Season 2 of How Would Lubitsch Do It? A podcast in which we discuss the works of director Ernst Lubitsch, one film at a time. It's March 1920, and today Maddie Whittle joins us to discuss Romeo and Juliet in the Snow. Come visit ErnstCast.com if you'd like show notes, resources as to where you might find the films we'll be discussing, or just to say hi. Hello, everyone. We are here with Maddie Whittle. Do you want to tell us a bit about yourself? What's your deal? And what made you want to hop on the famous, famous Bavarian set adaptation of Romeo and Juliet by our favorite director who's been dead for 76 years? Well, first of all, thank you for having me. As you said, I'm Maddie Whittle. I work as an assistant programmer at Film at Lincoln Center, working with the year-round programming team, as well as programming the annual New York Film Festival. In addition to that, I do some freelance work as a translator from French into English and do some film writing on the side as well. I have been published a few times in Film Comment, so you can find me there every once in a while. As for your second question, I have to say I am a bit of a Lubitsch novice. I am familiar with his more famous Hollywood films, but virtually not at all versed in his pre-Hollywood career and sort of how he got where he ended up getting. And I was really excited to be invited to be on this podcast just in general because I do love the Lubitsch films that I have seen and wanted to have an opportunity to see one that I hadn't seen, specifically a Shakespeare adaptation of a play that I'm very well acquainted with and acquainted with other cinematic adaptations of, but very unacquainted with the circumstances around this particular film. And so I thought that that would be an exciting introduction to this period of Lubitsch's career for me personally. That's great. Of the later stuff that you've seen, are there any films that are particularly close to your heart or otherwise? How did you end up first encountering the works of Lubitsch? I actually can't remember which I saw first, but when I was young, both my parents in different ways are movie buffs in their own right and introduced me and my sisters to old movies at various ages in our youth. And I remember as a kid watching The Shop Around the Corner, in part because I had seen You Got Mail a hundred times. And my mom at one point said, oh, you should see the Jimmy Stewart film that You Got Mail is based on. And so we watched The Shop Around the Corner and I was completely enchanted. Probably around that time, I also saw Trouble in Paradise and was just sort of dazzled by the sort of elegance, the glamour, the old Hollywood sophistication of it. Mm. And also sort of, I would say, fascinated by the very particular tone of it, the sort of arch understated kind of comedy that it brings to the romantic comedy genre. So, you know, as a kid, I think I accessed it on a certain level. That film in particular, Trouble in Paradise, I've revisited it various moments in my adult life and always take something new from it. In fact, I rewatched it in preparation for this conversation just oh, to get cool. back in touch with my yeah. my Lubitsch roots. It's just there's no other film like it. The handling of a love triangle in that film. There's an effortless feel to it that I just find captivating. He's really good at doing a whole lot without seeming like he's doing anything or really trying. Yes, a lightness of touch. Yeah. And that lightness of touch is not all that consistent or present in this period of his career. In fact, Romeo and Juliet in the Snow, which is the 1920 film we're talking about today, is one of the subtlest films of this era, which is not saying much. And so, you know, this is, of course, an incredibly accurate beat for beat slavish adaptation of... No, it's not. This is a travesty on the play. It I totally stole words from Tim Brayton's own review of this. This is essentially a farce that uses the play of Romeo and Juliet as a rough guideline, I would say. It's set in a remote country bumpkin village in Bavaria. This is actually the second of two after Cole Heisel's daughters. Bavarian rustic adaptations of Shakespeare that he's done in 1920, which is an incredibly maybe underdiscussed little turn in his career. He just apparently wanted to do it. This was uh, Lubitsch's own initiative. At this point, Madame Dubarry had just 
come out and it was a ginormous hit. It was possibly, one could argue, the biggest hit of his whole career. Then he goes off to the mountains to make two very, very willfully rustic films. <laughs> I must admit that, I mean, after Madame Dewberry and looking forward to films like Sumeru and Anna and Bolin and Loves of the Pharaoh, all of which are these opulent epics, I really dug this movie. I found it kind of lovely and the fact that it's only available on like I have an AVI file it's also on YouTube and probably someone uploaded this very AVI file in a very potato quality version this is among the worst looking transfers of any film we've discussed in this podcast it's kind of sad to me because I really found this delightful and funny I'm curious to see your thoughts on it yeah I uh, was very won over by this film I mean uh, you know obviously Romeo and Juliet comes with a certain set of expectations and Lubitsch also also comes with a certain set of expectations and on paper they don't necessarily seem like an intuitive fit but in this film you can really see the sort of more playful qualities of the original play really come to the fore there's a lot of comedy in the original Romeo and Juliet and Lubitsch seems to have taken that as sort of a launch point for turning the entire story into a sort of comedic fable in a way that ends up being sort of charming and satisfying. And mm -hmm. there's a subtlety to the humor that I think really goes hand in hand with the irony that's already there in the text. And he's just sort of drawing it out and embellishing it in places, adding characters, adding sort of scenarios within the broader scenario that sort of highlight different themes within this very, very familiar story that we could probably all recount in very degrees of detail, but he takes that outline and seems to be having a lot of fun with it. I know that he himself acted in Shakespeare plays prior to his directing career, and I think you can kind of see his real affection for the subject matter. Yeah, to go all the way back to his early days, his very first audition was, in his own words, Shylock from Merchant of Venice, as it had never been played and hopefully never since, and that's in Lubitsch's own words. It's clearly something that's close to his heart. And I'm glad that you mentioned the fact that Romeo and Juliet's kind of funny, because I think this is something that is often lost in the, I was about to say the discourse about Romeo and Juliet, but who discourses over that? <laughs> You know, something that's often lost in the popular conceptions of the play is that the play is only sort of a melodrama. It's half young lovers, you know, oh, but it's also half young lovers. Oh, look at those. It really feels like it's written from a remove by you know, an older man who is like looking down at these very silly lovers and their lack of long term decision making. And there's so much bodiness in, you know, I remember reading Romeo and Juliet in various high school classes and getting into the sort of body racy innuendo in the text and that is, to me, feels like sort of the dominant tone of Lubitsch's films. It's just sort of reveling in the fact that love, sex, romance comes with these very impassioned heights of feeling, absolutely, that lend themselves to drama and tragedy. But it's they're also very bodily and grounded in the absurdity of human bodies and mm -hmm. earthly concerns like financial transactions and it's the human justice system comes into play in this film in a way that is sort of feels grounded in this very embodied, very connected to the material plane perspective on a romantic relationship. And this interfaces very well with Lubitsch's focus on objects as an externalizing force for character traits. So you have, I mean, the very first beat in the film, right? You have this wonderful kind of cascading series of gags where the judge character, who is kind of the constable, kind of the friar, <laughs> the characters are kind of prismatically split a little. But you have the first gag in the film is him receiving bribes from the Capulets and Montagues, sausages, the helpfully labeled, I would say, by these very over-descriptive subtitles. <laughs> and then he has a little, a very cliche scales of justice and he weighs the sausages with the scales of justice. So immediately we get this sense of, okay, this is the bodiness of Shakespeare taken down 10 notches into this rural tale of justice being decided by who can provide the best sausage. Even sort of literalized in the sense that you see the judge consulting with both families and then he has to go and consult with the sausages and <laughs> comes back to them and says, OK, well, now I've determined who the winner is. And we know the audience that it's just on the basis of who gave him the bigger sausage. The comic timing is perfect. The sort of mise en scène, the way the bodies are choreographed in this space has a very slapstick kind of rhythm to it. All this just within the prelude, which is a nice sort of expansion, I think, on sort of the prologue of the play that sets the scene of this conflict between the two families. Here, Lubitsch really turns it into sort of a set piece in itself. 
it's interesting the scenes that he chooses to expand upon or turn into these grand farces and then the scenes that he choose like this is almost like an adaptation of the first half of Romeo and Juliet and then the second half is it's a race because spoiler alert this film does not end with them dying that's right and two the events that take up the entire second half of the play are rocketed through in about what eight minutes <laughs> it's it and yet there's what six or seven minutes spent on a no that's more like the prelude is more like 10 minutes i think it's so weirdly balanced yeah and yet when the ending comes it feels right somehow mm-hmm. i don't know if it's because we all know the story you know in our bones and so there's sort of a, an impatience for <laughs> things to wrap up at the end but i felt that the way in which the story becomes kind of accelerated into this ultimately surprise, happy, comedic ending to a story that we're used to having a drawn out, very dramatic, tragic finale. It sort of just hammers home that the comedy is the point in this film and that the sort of wrapping things up with a tidy bow at the end is consistent with the cheeriness that the film is trying to get across as opposed to the sort of heaviness that could be drawn out of this story. And the deployment of the comedy, both times I've watched this, I watched this once a few months ago and then again last night, really impressed me where this really ought to be a one note movie. It really ought to be, I mean, most of the jokes do boil down to one of two things and usually just combines it to. It's one, can you believe that this is Romeo and Juliet? And two, look at these country bumpkins. Like just everything is so small scale like the big kind of battle between the two families is a very small snowball fight (laughs) there's like a brawl scene but it's very sort of slapdash and it feels more haphazard than you know a proper sort of mob scene would and this is the director who just three episodes ago staged the french revolution I mean, he's Max Reinhardt's guy. He can do crowd scenes and he chooses to, it isn't that he's ignoring it, it's that he's specifically choosing a very, very rustic toolkit, which kind of feels like The Doll, which is the film that, again, from two episodes ago, where the entire film feels like it was made by five-year-olds, deliberately. This is not quite that extreme, but yeah, no, there's this sense of like, okay, we're just a bunch of local theater actors play-acting Shakespeare in the mountains. And having fun with it, having a lot of fun with it. I was so taken with so many of the actors, none of mm-hmm. whom I was familiar with, but they're all... All, several of them have faces that remind me of like a Daumier painting, just very sort of overwrought with, again, kind of slapsticky mm-hmm. expressiveness. And I just felt immediately, it's a very short film, you know, relative to, to the feature format, but it's so economical in the way that it conveys these characters and so sort of exuberant in the theatricality that they're all just clearly having a lot of fun with. All the actors... I think, know what their assignment is. They understand the tone in a way that I found very interesting. They're all on the same page about what version of Romeo and Juliet they are telling. And it's interesting, too, seeing the similarities between these performances and everything we've seen in The Doll and Colhazy's Daughter and even something like Madame Dewberry when things get really over the top or looking forward to Loves of the Pharaoh. Because Lubitsch at this point, even now, is doing the thing they'd become notorious for, which is he would act out physically the beats of most of the actors. He would do it and then just basically said, do it like I did and put your own spin on it, but do it like I did. (laughs) So you get this very specific body language that everyone shares. It creates a real sense of consistency, I think. It's a very unified narrative. It moves quickly, I think, in part because it's very streamlined. Yeah, it's only 46 minutes, which means it's a, I guess, a four-reeler. Unless it's always possible stuff is missing. I mean, only like less than an hour exists of Loves the Pharaoh. And that was, I think, an almost a two-hour film. So it, things could be missing, but nothing feels missing here. <laughs> feels like all the beats are there. Yeah. It does. It feels complete, even as though there are significant portions of the play that are excised. There's no nurse character. There's no Friar Lawrence character. Mm-hmm. But the film does fine without those pieces. It sort of supplements the skeleton of the story with its own additions, like the character of John, who's kind of this simple country boy who's... The village idiot, I think. (laughs) Yes. His parents and the Capulets are scheming to set him up in an arranged marriage with Juliet, and uh, she's not having it. And as far as I know, there's no real Mercutio in this. There's a Tybalt. And Tybalt is quite funny. There's that great scene where Tybalt cuts what looks like bread with a huge sword. Yes. (laughs) But like cuts it daintily as you would with a paring knife. It's lovely. I take notes for all these. And it's hard for me not to just like go through the film and go like, I thought this was hilarious. And I thought Mm -hmm. this was hilarious Mm -hmm. because everything is, I mean, I love that. I'm just going to stick to one here, which I love. I love the way that the balcony scene is treated. (laughs) Yes. Yes. I 
that was one of the things I was going to bring up. There's no balcony at all, and yet it completely works as an interpretation of the balcony scene. It's it's turned into this farce, right, where Romeo brings his giant ladder up to her window, and then, oh, someone's coming. He has to slide down the ladder, and then she's like, oh, coast is clear. He comes back up. Oh, someone's coming again, and he has to hide in the room. And There's a dog at the bottom of the ladder, so he can't slide down and escape. So he has to hide under the bed, and so then they're suddenly alone together in the bedroom. That's when Romeo says, I'll marry you with my, my sword. sword. <laughs> and he pulls his sword out. And the sword, too, is it's like cut off. There's only about eight inches of the sword left. Yes. It's, oh gosh, that was great. And again, that's one a great example of very, very clever condensation where in the play, again, a lot of time goes by between balcony scene and the climax where they both die or the poison is introduced. In this, he brings it up immediately because he's in her bedroom. So it's just the replotting enables that in a fun way. It's true that it's, I think the balcony scene kind of kicks off the sequence of events that very quickly ends up wrapping up the film. Mm-hmm. And they all right. Can we spoil how the film plays out? Is oh, that we okay? can spoil everything. I mean, it's Romeo and Juliet, <laughs> and this time they live. The twist, exactly how they live, yeah. is that through no devising of their own, they mm-hmm. go to buy poison to drink, and the the apothecary, apothecary who they are going to buy poison from, just decides that he will swap out the poison that's in the bottle and replace it with sugar water because yes. he <laughs> perceives that they are suicidal and wants to help them. I suppose. And so they go off on their merry way with what they think is poison, but it's actually not. And they take it and leave a suicide note. So their families find it and their families rush to the barn where they have taken this non-poison. <laughs> Romeo almost drinks it all because it tastes good, as he says. This, yes. is, this doesn't taste too bad. And she's like, no, no, I want some. Just some nice, simple syrup, you know? Yeah. <laughs> They realize that their families are coming to find them. And so they play dead and their families have this very tearful reconciliation, thinking that their children are dead, just like in the play. But then, of course, because they are, in fact, alive, they spring up and everybody's stunned and they all hug and everyone's happy. It's the ending Romeo and Juliet might have had if it was a comedy, if it was one of Shakespeare's (laughs) comedies instead of the tragedy that it is. I just love how the scene is played, especially the scene when they think they're committing mutual suicide. They're both just mock crying for about three minutes on end. Just like (laughs) this this endless self-pity of the two of them just going, oh, what was us? Oh, we had like candles extinguished in the wind too early. You know, it's just a lovely blowing up of the inherent self-pity of the characters in the actual play, which is lovely. They're sort of mythologizing themselves (laughs) in the moment as they go. And then, of course, you cut to Juliet's fiance still downstairs. (laughs) Oblivious. In the second dunking joke (laughs) of this retrospective, I'm trying to keep track of every time there's a dunking joke. This is number two. Which I thought that there would be more in the Berlin period, but no, either they're lost or they're, he really started to get into in Hollywood. Which film was the first? The first was Shoe Palace Pincus. Okay. Which is the second film of this whole thing where there is, in fact, a dunking joke and it had become a thing. Like, I think there's two dunking jokes in Trouble in Paradise. Yes. Both Kay Francis and Mary Hopkins, like, hide their dunks. And it's just continues and continues. Chop Around the Corner has my favorite, which is the crawl like she is dunking line. But uh, this one has one, which I have no great thesis here except to note it. <laughs> Maybe Lubitsch was a dunker. Lubitsch would have loved Duncan if uh, he had lived to experience it. Yeah. I mean, in this case, it's a very basic joke where it's just, I think this might be the most kind of base of the dunking jokes, which is just this village idiot is uncultured. So therefore he dunks and and film. That's the final beat. And just over and over and over again, he's got like a pile of bread or cake and he's just sitting alone at this party that was supposed to be celebrating his engagement and just (laughs) dunking morosely eating. I do want to highlight the scene too, where Romeo and Juliet are waving at each other from the balconies or from their attic they're not balconies but they're these little windows in the attic and Juliet gets so distracted she drops her bed sheet I think that she's cleaning onto her father her father comes upstairs and then another laundry joke he's about to hit her with this you know the thing that you beat laundry with he's about to hit her with it but ends up getting distracted because he happens to hit another dirty piece of laundry on a chair and he's like oh this needs cleaning so he's just <laughs> literally he's, uh, lizard brain switches to doing the laundry while she's cowering in terror which just all these little objects in this film are just Anyways, I'm, I feel like I have less of an ongoing thread here just because this film is built up of so many little moments that it's overperforming the little details. <laughs> in some ways, each scene feels like a sketch in its own mm-hmm. right. I mean, the masked ball is its own showpiece. Oh, that whole thing. Yeah. Which is great fun and has sort of a beginning, middle and an end of its own. And it's just playing out the sort of comic drama of 
two bourgeois parents who want to see their daughter married off to the son of some other bourgeois family. And even, you know, though he's the town idiot, they're delighted that this engagement is imminent. And so they are focused on that. And meanwhile, Romeo and Juliet are both at this ball together and need to contrive a way that they can enjoy their time together without raising the alarm. It is full of so many little great moments. Like, I mean, I'm not quite sure exactly what Romeo's plan is with like why he leads the village idiot home or not why, but I know what his plan is, but how the logistics of that work, but the whole kind of affair of the mistaken identity and then the village idiot walks back in. I should preface by saying Romeo steals Juliet's fiance, who is a village idiot, steals his costume by leading him home into his comical hut. It is the worst abode I've ever seen on screen. And then comes back in what is actually an angel costume. I wonder if Baz Luhrmann saw this. Comes back in the angel costume. Obviously, the village idiot drunkenly wanders back in just in his underwear, basically. And that's when Father Capulet realizes what's happened. And it's... Yes. <laughs> Because they see this angel figure dancing with and kissing and canoodling with Juliet. And they're delighted because they think, oh, this is our son-in-law. You know, they're getting along great. It's the perfect match. And then <laughs> when poor John comes stumbling back in, they realize, oh, no, that's not our son-in-law. That's some imposter. <laughs> of course, it's chaos after that. But I do love that part of what incites this whole scene is that Capulet encourages this poor guy, John, to have a drink, to yes. embolden him, to approach Juliet and, you know, <laughs> woo Juliet. And so John goes off to the bar and he has some drinks and Romeo is there and they, you know, clink glasses and Romeo realizes that this guy is getting drunk. And so he spots an opening and he's like, oh, I can take this guy home and, you know, maybe take his place because he's nearly incapacitated. And so ultimately it was Capulet's own doing that made his son-in-law to be vulnerable to this whole swap. And then it's there's a moment where Lady Capulet says to her husband, maybe you should have a few drinks. <laughs> Again, very much in line with the body humor of like the nurse in the play, you know, that kind of unapologetically, not even suggestive. It's really a proposition. And it's interesting, too, how that despite the fact that this film is so compressed, the party scene is not the scene where Romeo and Juliet meet in this. That's right. They meet, just happen to run into each other on the street. I say street, but it's really just a country road <laughs> in between the church and the town. And there's a lot I want to say about this scene in terms of the continuity of it. But the party is now almost takes the place of the balcony scene in a weird way in the original narrative, where it's the scene where they basically fall deeper in love and get to know each other more. In this case, because they've massively convoluted the party scene beyond what it originally was written for. The order of operations is, is that's shifted. I'm interested to hear more about the continuity issues with the snowball scene, because it's a very strikingly shot scene. And it, the way that Lubitsch uses the setting of this little Bavarian town, which is indeed snow covered, the snow is omnipresent mm -hmm. in all the exterior shots in this. It's a great scene. I'm curious to hear your thoughts on it. It's a great example of the way that Lubitsch was still fairly early in his process of internalizing Hollywood continuity conventions, because at this point, I mean, we're right after the end of World War One in terms of when this was produced. And this was probably shot in the winter of 1920. And so the trade cutoff in terms of American films in Germany had recently ceased because the end of World War I. And so Lubitsch was one of the first movers in terms of actually studying Hollywood films and properly being influenced by their construction. And classical continuity had already taken quite a bit of hold in Hollywood. So this is an example of a scene that feels like it exists without reference to that at all. Because let's talk about two things, geography and the 180 rule. The 180 degree rule, a.k.a. the axis of action, is, as we, of course, all know, and every listener, I don't no, expect listeners to know this, you basically draw an imaginary line between your two causal agents in a scene, your two actors usually. Then you keep the camera on the same side of that to avoid what happens in the scene, which is that Romeo and Juliet, when they intercut to each other, are facing in the same direction. They're both looking towards screen right, which kind of breaks the illusion that they're looking at each other. Now, in a Hollywood film in 1930, you would say, oh, what a mistake. But in a German film in 1920, that wasn't a key part of the vocabulary necessarily. And so the idea, the framework of that had not been fully conceived and realized at that time and place. So it basically wasn't an issue, right? The audiences had not been programmed to expect that. 
And it isn't really a problem because it's never really in question their spatial relationship, except in one way, right? Romeo is, quote, looking in the wrong direction. But you also have the interesting kind of play with space where if you look... So Juliet walks by Romeo and seems to make it about 15 paces before she stops. We don't really... It cuts to singles. There's no shot with the two of them in that after that. And then cut to Romeo, picks up snow, lobs a fairly poorly packed snowball at her. And like lobs is a strong word. He... Uh, you know, it's like, he looks like he throws it about two feet. Kind of pushes it. Exactly. He kind of heaves it off screen lightly. <laughs> Cut to Juliet. She gets a snowball in the back. It's very funny. You know, we're probably expecting there's maybe 20 feet of distance, 30 feet of distance between them. Cut to the wide shot and there's like 100 plus feet between them. They are very far apart. And not only that, but in the wide shot, Romeo has to run around a corner to get to her. Are we supposed to believe that that snowball is like the bullet that curved, you know, in that one day in Dallas? No. Either way, what we have there is a, I think, probably deliberate play with space, right? To kind of, you know, one, have Romeo throw a snowball at Juliet. And two, also have that very wacky run he does around the corner where he's scrambling and suddenly the distance is much longer than we expected. I wasn't there on the day. I can't say that that was intentional, but it definitely feels like the product of a system of shooting that didn't necessarily prize continuity over moment to moment hilarity. Absolutely. No, the sort of the effect of the distance between them when it's revealed, even if it's jarring, sort of, at least for me in my experience of watching it very quickly, that sort of jarring surprise is smoothed over by the sort of punchline effect of it. It's like, oh, wow, you know, there's a football field between them or, you know, not quite that much distance. It sort of throws you off a little bit, I think, as a viewer in a way that communicates the sort of bolt of lightning effect of this love at first sight meeting that they've just had where they're both sort of knocked on their passes. I mean, and that's uh, continued in the kind of chaos of the snowball fight later, right? Yes. You have at least four people lobbing snowball after snowball at each other. And I've seen the film twice. I cannot figure out who is throwing snowballs at who or what their exact spatial relationship is. But that's not the point, right? The point is that it's very funny to see Mr. Capulet heaving these snowballs and then Romeo just like puttering them off like that. And then Juliet in a side shot laughing at them both. Each of those shots is funny. It's three funny disconnected shots that happen to form a scene versus a worked out set of geographical relationships, right? which is sort of seems to be the effect over execution is key here. The, the fact that the impression that you come away with from a scene overrides any quote unquote errors within it. It seems like season two is becoming the classical Hollywood cinematography deconstruction season because this has become a common refrain in a lot of the episodes so far, which is this idea that we're in a very interesting period here where the framework in which Lubitsch is making films is changing. So how are we to judge the craft, right? Are we to judge the craft on what he was doing in 1916, three years earlier? Or are we judging the craft as to what he was doing in 1924 when he was in Hollywood making Rosita and suddenly everything is rock solid? in the way that it wasn't here. Are we supposed to compare it against that solidity or are we supposed to be a little deflated that he's not as anarchic as he was when he made The Oyster Princess? It's an interesting question. Yeah, this is certainly sort of imagining the path between this film and, say, Trouble in Paradise has itself gotten me interested in charting out that trajectory that he is on because in some ways there seems to be a great distance that he covered in the intervening years. And yet there's like a lineage in the sort of tone and the sensibility that truly does feel like it's sort of an auteur signature. But how does that interact with the sort of technical working out of the kinks of making a film that he's learning in real time along with the rest of the industry? The question of the auteur signature here is really interesting to me because later on, of course, we all know in the Hollywood years, he had a signature. He's very identifiable. You can look at his own and go, yeah, yeah, that's Ernst. Or that's someone trying to be Ernst. But in this, I've come down on seeing the Berlin period as this strange overlapping like Venn diagram of traits between the films, right? Where if, for example, we can arbitrarily start with like Madame Dewberry, there's almost no overlap between Madame Dewberry and this thing. But there is overlap between Madame Dewberry and like the opulence of the Oyster Princess. And there is overlap between the Oyster Princess and the kind of anarchic comedy of this. And there's an overlap between both of them and the doll. And then the doll has, you know, so it's almost like he has certain things that are common between certain films, but there's almost nothing that unites his whole filmography at this point. He's going in so many directions. And that's just 
the films that are surviving, right? He made, I mean, only four of his seven films in 1919 survives, for example. So who knows what else he did? All we have are trade papers. I am so taken by the sets and the sort of location mm. in which this was shot. And I was wondering if you mentioned that not much is known about the making of this film or its history. But do you know, like, is it what is this village that uh, <laughs> that is being presented to us as this sort of idyllic, rustic Bavarian village? I can't speak to the village, but I can speak to the production designer, Kurt Richter, who was one of Lubitsch's most consistent collaborators at this time. He served as the art director, production designer for the vast majority of Lubitsch's films in this period. He did Madame du Barry, Anna Boleyn, The Oyster Princess. He was, at this point, actually, I mean, he would get massive, like conspicuously large credit on all of the films. Like he was definitely quite, by all appearances, it seems that he was, as far as production designers go, very well respected. And this is a weird one for him because this runs in the exact opposite direction as a lot of his work for Lubitsch. He was responsible for everything from Madame Dewberry's opulence to the doll's extreme DIY. But this even seems small scale for him, where it's, I'm so curious as to how much of this village was built and how much of this village was just them putting little touches to make an already decrepit place look even more rustic. Yes, because it feels more lived in than many sets of that time do. Mm. It feels there are scenes that are very clearly sets, but there are other interiors that feel like they could be found interiors. And it's a little bit, Mm -hmm. it's unclear. It's a little ambiguous. Is this designed from the ground up or was this adapted from an existing location? Knowing kind of how they shot these, my guess is that all the interiors were probably shot at Tempelhof. At least all the interiors were likely studio, but the exteriors were, he definitely shot this and Kohlheise's daughters and Meyer from Berlin in the Bavarian Alps. <laughs> so all the exteriors, and that's the thing, like, is John's horrific hovel of a place that is clearly uninhabitable, is that a Kurt Richter creation? Or is that just they found a cabin that was maybe decrepit and then distressed it a little more? Who knows? So much of the movie sort of unfolds in these folds between the buildings Mm -hmm. in these exterior spaces. They're exteriors, but you feel closed in within the framework of this village. Seems to be having fun with these spaces that are specifically the exterior snow-covered spaces that I was surprised by all of the exteriors, all of the sort of time that is spent just out Mm -hmm. being rough and tumble in the snow. And, you know, the characters having snowball fights and falling on their butts and sliding down an icy slope. And it's very embedded in its environment, kind of. Yeah. And I, I, for about the only time in his career, Lubitsch is doing extensive location work in this period. The only time before and after that he didn't. But you have these three films set in the Alps that he just the third is the wildcat which if uh, I think is a good follow up to this because that film basically combines like the maximalism and like the oyster princess with the alpineness of this it's basically like the first Wes Anderson film ever made it's ridiculous but I wonder what drove him to shoot in the Alps specifically and why he pushed for it so hard he insisted on doing it for the wildcat I think over the um I believe it was over the protestations of the art designers huh they wanted it all studio. He was like, no, we're shooting the Alps. But nowhere else on their earth, even when he was in Berlin, he didn't really shoot many exteriors except for stuff on constructed sets. And even those were very obviously constructed. But this film has tons of them. Or like maybe the Berlin quarries in Pharaoh. But I wonder why he never did this again. I guess Hollywood, you don't really do locations in Hollywood in the classical era. Maybe Bavaria was his muse and he just couldn't find it anywhere else. <laughs> I wonder if he had some special love for that place. But yeah, it's, um, I'd be so curious to see this film in a proper restored version. I wonder if he, like, for so many of these films, they're in such tenuous shape that some of them have been just telecine 20 years ago and they've deteriorated since then. So I really hope that this is salvageable. Yeah, do you know if any prints exist? I know nothing about this. This is, I'd say, more than any other Ernst Lubitsch film. This is the one where this and Cole Heisel's daughters, there is so little written about them. Even in, it gets like a sentence in the Scott Amy book. And I, you know, in historically probably justified in the sense that this film was very inconsequential. But at the same time, I think it's a lovely film that deserves, I think all these films deserve a 4K restoration, lovingly curated, all the yeah. money thrown at it. But. Live piano accompaniment, you know, let's uh, get that score written. Oh, yeah. No, I, we should also mention this copy doesn't have a score. <laughs> and it completely works. I have to say, watching it in complete silence, there's the sort of kinetic visual energy mm-hmm. is so animated. It just carries you right along. You know, sometimes I think without music, a silent film can feel hard to reach that level of immersion that allows you to slip into the narrative mm-hmm. completely. And this it was pretty effortless with this film, I have to say. 
my coping mechanism was I put on the Osipov State Russian Folk Orchestra's album Balalaika Favorites. Nice. And if you cut off Flight of the Bumblebees at the end, it's almost the exact same length as the film. It syncs up really well. So if anyone's on Spotify or whatever, YouTube, Apple, Play Music or whatever, that was a great experience. These two together. That's a great tip. Because I wouldn't have known where to begin looking for something to match with it. So that's uh, that's great. Just as somebody who does have very vivid memories of reading this play in high school in two different grades, eighth grade and ninth grade. I love that they do recreate the do you bite your thumb at me, sir, scene. Yes. Except instead of thumb biting, somebody is sticks their tongue out at the other person. <laughs> And there's that great line where it's, I put my tongue wherever I please or whatever. Yes. Yes. Again, it's like, it's a riff. It's a variation on the scene that impeccably captures the tone of the original scene in the play, which is, I think of that opening as sort of inseparable from the rest of Romeo and Juliet. I'm a little surprised that this film isn't cited more often as a particularly interesting adaptation of Shakespeare, even. Of all the versions of, I think I've only ever seen four cinematic no i mean there's two west side stories so five cinematic versions of romeo and juliet and take away the musicals and this one might be my favorite of the three <laughs> between this the zeffirelli and the lerman i really enjoyed this <laughs> maybe i'm underrating well i think uh, setting this next to the lerman and the zeffirelli this one to me is truest to the spirit of shakespeare's sense of humor at the very least, I would say yes, absolutely. I mean, it doesn't quite have, if we're going to compare it against musicals, the mambo scene is a little bit more uh, spectacular than the mass ball in this. Although this right. one does have the giant paper mache heads. Yes, or just sort of go unexplained as a delightful little grace note to a scene. Yeah, it's. I mean, there's so many little details in the background of this. Just It's full of all the little Ernst Lubitsch gestures, especially if you, dear listeners, have watched every film up to this point. This film has so many little bits that you'll probably recognize as very typical Lubitsch for this period. So it's just, it's a dense movie in its own strange 46 minute long way. It's lovely. I really enjoyed it. And I'm kind of happy to have this as a note to go on before we're about to enter two weeks of very long and slightly turgid historical epics. <laughs> Gotta get this one in there to tide you over. Yes. I'm so good at convincing listeners to listen to the next episode, which is the turgid <laughs> Sumeroon. <laughs> But yes, thank you so much for joining us on this episode. It was great to get to meet you properly and to talk about a film that I, one of the most surprising films of this whole retrospective for me. I had not seen it before embarking on the podcast and it's cool to genuinely feel like we have unearthed something that is truly underappreciated. Absolutely. I mean, it does make me, I am kind of curious now to go and use my film programming toolbox to see if there are any archival prints of it anywhere that have just been, you know, presumably gathering dust. <laughs> there has to be one somewhere. We just got to find it. I bet it's in some sort of Berlin or Munich film archive. Well, thanks so much. And is there anywhere that our listeners can find you? Anything that you have that's particularly online that uh, you'd like them to read or witness? Well, you can always find me on Twitter at Maddie Whittle. I tend to put various assorted thoughts about films there. I also, as I mentioned, am a programmer at Film at Lincoln Center. So if you're in the New York area and looking for some exciting art house cinema, you should look us up. We program year round and always have something exciting going on. Then otherwise, you can occasionally read my writing in Film Comment, which is free to access online. Check me out there. Thank you for joining us and have a great rest of your day. Thank you so much. It's a pleasure. Next week, Sumeroon. Griffin Scheel was our dialogue editor for this episode. Head over to www.ernstcast.com for links to the various public domain films we'll be discussing this season and other resources such as show notes. How Would Lubitsch Do It is a production of Moving Image Agency. If you enjoyed this episode, please rate and review us on whatever podcast service you happen to use. We'd like to acknowledge that this podcast was produced on the unceded territory of the Musqueam, Squamish, and tsleil peoples. 